Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to CBGRAPI 2021. My name is Leandro Fernandes, and I will be the chair of the session. It's a great honor for me to introduce the presenters of this tutorial. Will Dorst is an authority in geometric algebra and the, and the author of the book Geometric Algebra for Computer Science. It's the most used reference book on the subject. Steven DeKenning is a graphics programmer who is researching the use of geometric algebra in computer graphics. He runs the website and forum by vector.net. After this introduction, I will send you the link to the website via YouTube chat. Um, well, they presented previously on the subject of this tutorial at SIGGRAPH uh, 2019, GAME and CGI uh, 2020. About the dynamics of the session, uh, the tutorial was divided into six episodes. First, we will watch the recordings of episodes one and two, totaling about uh, 50 minutes, followed by a 10 minute break. Then we will watch episodes three and four, also approximately 50 minutes long, and take another 10 minute break. Finally, Episodes five and six will be shown, ending with the live questions and answers. You can ask your questions from YouTube, uh, YouTube chat, of course, and the channel of this tutorial on CBGRAP's uh, Discord server. Will uh, endorsed, uh, sorry, Will Dorst and Steven, uh, thank you so much for taking your time to prepare this tutorial for us. Uh, the stage is yours. Hello, I'm Stephen. Uh, thanks to the organizers for having us. Um, we are both uh, very much looking forward to uh, introducing this series of videos, and we hope the audience will enjoy watching them as much as we did making them. Yes, and I'm Leo. Uh, we we did have great fun uh, making these things. I'm actually staying over at Stephen's house now so that uh, we can answer your questions together. Uh, Get your questions coming. We will keep track of them as you type them in, but we'll answer them at the very end. Okay. Thank you, Leandro. You can uh, start. Uh, uh, well, uh, please, the staff, uh, put the, the first video. The title of this first episode is The Reflection Menace. We've got three hours to do this course, so we decided to uh, cut that up into six different episodes. There's going to be two episodes where we mostly deal with motivation and intuition. I'll be teaching those. Then there are two episodes where Leo will take you through the algebraic foundation. And then the final two episodes will be spent doing some actual implementation of inverse kinematics and rigid body dynamics system. Here are the titles of the episode. So the orange ones are the intuition geometry ones. The cyan ones are those where we tackle the algebraic uh, details. And then the, in the green ones, we will be doing some programming. Let's get started. We will not assume that you are very familiar with geometric algebra yet. So let's start with a tiny, tiny overview. So geometric algebra is an alternative to vector and matrix algebra that is truly ideally suited for computer geometry. In a bit more of a mathematical sense, it is an algebra on a graded linear space with an invertible product that operates on multivectors. So this graded linear space really just means that it is a direct sum of the real numbers you already know, the vectors you already know, and then some new objects called bivectors, trivectors, and so on, all the way up to something called the pseudoscalar. Leo will go into much more detail on that. Let's first look at some of the advantages that we get. It is much more manifestly coordinate free. It can be made to work dimension independent, which is actually something that we will focus on in this first episode. It is chirality agnostic, which means the handedness you pick for your coordinate system makes no difference. It's got exception free incidence relations, it unifies transformations and elements, and it provides a tremendous reduction of formulas and code that we as graphics and game developers need to write. I have these two little examples to show you what formulas in PGA will look like. Here on the left, we have something called the sandwich product, which basically says you do A, multiply with B, 
multiply with twiddly, which is the reverse of A. And you can use this construction to transform any point, line, plane, direction with any rotor A. This second example perhaps is even more telling because this formula, A dot B divided by B, can actually be used to project any point, line, and plane on any point, line, and plane. So you can use the same formula to project a point on a line, or a plane on a point, or a line on a plane, and so on. If you compare this to what you would have to do in a classic approach, you get quite a different picture. So for the transformation, you might argue that it's mathematically similar because it's always going to be a matrix vector product. However, it's going to be for the same transformation, a different matrix. It's a different matrix to transform a point in a direction or to transform a plane. And the matrix to transform a line is actually a six by six matrix. Um, so these look similar, but really aren't. Um, in this case, it's the same A to transform any B. Here on the right, it's even worse. The code that you would write to project a point on a line or a plane on a point would be completely different, would have nothing to do with one another or look similar uh, at all. So that's quite a simplification you have going on here, making working with these geometric operations so much easier. Let us first, uh, however, look at this coordinate-free and dimension agnostic thing. I'm so assuming most of you know what coordinate-free means. And if you don't, don't worry, that's on a need to know basis. So let's focus on this dimension agnostic thing. This is not something we commonly expect. When you download a two dimensional physics engine, you don't expect to be able to open up some H file, change a define from two into three and get a working three dimensional physics engine. It's actually even worse because most of the mathematics that we use commonly in computer graphics and game programming is uh, valid only in three dimensions. For example, you've used the cross product. So as soon as you do, you should no longer expect your code to work in two or four dimensions. And we want to ask the question, can we do better? And to ask that question uh, requires us to take a close look at some of the basic fundamental concepts. So everybody recognizes this picture. Um, and the statement we want to make with this picture is this is not a vector. Now, of course, it is a vector, and I'm just trying to be funny, but there's a whole lot more than a vector here. We have an origin, we have two uh, selected coordinate axes, we have a defined scale, and so on. If you take all that away, and you are an amorph blob in empty space with a ruler, and all you can see is this little vector, then, well, you can't even uh, determine the dimensionality of the space. You know it's at least 1D because you have this one vector, but you, it could as well be a 17-dimensional space. And can you still determine the orientation? Well, not really. The only thing you can really do is you can take your ruler and measure the length of the vector. So only the length is well-defined. Now, if we extend this and we add a second non-collinear vector, then we can measure some more things. We can measure two lengths, one angle, and we are absolutely certain that our space is at least two dimensional. It could still be 17 dimensional, but it will at least be two dimensional. And so there's definitely more to being dimension agnostic, and we will go into the details. But not having an origin and not having a coordinate system is absolutely a good start. And the same reasoning that we apply here to vectors actually also applies to points and lines. If we have geometric elements sitting in empty space, then it could be a uh, space of different types of dimension. And so the relations and the formulas that we make between points and points and lines, like translation between points or projections of points onto lines or distances and so on, they should be independent of the dimensionality of the space and thus these expressions should be independent on the number of coordinates used to write down these elements A, B and C. And the key to all of this is going to be something called the geometric numbers. Now to discover the geometric numbers all we need to do is study this particularly simple quadratic equation. And it helps to have a picture with this equation, and the picture is not going to be the common picture we have with the quadratic equation. Instead, this is the picture. So what we are really doing is we are saying, okay, x squared is a square uh, with sides of x. And this one here is really one squared, so it's also a squared, just like zero is zero squared, and it's also a squared, and this entire expression is just a sum of squares. 
Now, of course, to solve it, uh, we have to recognize that these edges, and particularly this red edge E here, is something special, because x squared is obviously minus 1, and we don't have a real number that squares to minus 1. So this edge here is not a real number. And we can just define it by saying, okay, red E is this edge of this uh, square, and it squares to minus 1. Now, of course, if this guy isn't a real number, then there's no reason for us to assume that green E or blue E would be real numbers. And so we follow the similar uh, construction, and we say green E is not a real number, but it squares to plus 1. And blue E is also the side of a square, so it's not a real number, and it squares to 0. And these three numbers are going to be the key to get all of those nice features for computer geometry. Now, these are really types of numbers. So we can use multiple red E's and multiple green E's. And the way we write it down is like this. Uh, so this defines the set of elements we are going to use. And we for, could, for example, have three green guys, uh, one red guy and one uh, blue guy. And then they would be called E1 to E5. And the first three would square to plus one, the fourth one would square to minus one, and the fifth one would square to zero. Now, Leo will go into much more of the algebra, but we should first take a look at this funky green E guy. Do we actually know something in the real world that isn't a real number and that squares to identity? And in fact, we do. It's a reflection. It's a mirror. And that's exactly what these numbers will be used to represent in the plane-based geometric algebra. So when you reflect something twice, you get back to the identity, and this involuntary nature is exactly expressed by this green E number. And it will actually turn out that all of the transformations and all of the elements in PGA are built by doing nothing more than composing reflections. And in mathematics, such a set of compositions of reflections is something that shows up in group theory. And uh, Felix Klein has gone into a lot more detail on that in his very influential Erlangen program. And he would make the statement Euclidean geometry is the geometry of the Euclidean group. So let us look at that Euclidean group. Let us look at those compositions of reflections. And of course, we'll start simple with the composition of two reflections. The simplest case is when the two mirrors are identical. So if we reflect twice in the same mirror, then quite obviously we simply get the identity transformation. If we take parallel mirrors and we reflect twice into parallel mirrors, then what we get is a translation. We will translate our original object with twice the distance between the mirrors. So it's the relative distance between the mirrors here that determines how far you translate. And so obviously, if we take this back down to the same mirror, we will again end up with the identity map. The last case is the case where we have intersecting mirrors. So if we reflect twice in intersecting mirrors, then what we get is a rotation. And it is again a rotation with twice the angle between the mirrors. And again, if we rotate to the same mirror, then we end up with the identity transformation. Now, it is important to note that in both these cases, it is, it is only the relative distance and the relative angle between the mirrors that matters. This gives us what we call a gauge degree of freedom. That is, we can rotate both mirrors here without changing the end result. If we rotate around the intersection point, we rotate both mirrors, we don't change the intersection point, and we don't change the relative angle, and that means we get the same rotation. Similarly here, we can uh, move the two mirrors that cause the translation, and as long as the distance between them doesn't change and their direction doesn't change, then we end up with the same translation. Now, these gauge degrees of freedom, they can be used to understand what happens when we start composing more than two reflections. So we're still in the plane. Let us look at the composition of three reflections. When we reflect three times in the plane, we get two of these gauge degrees of freedom. We have a gauge here and we have a gauge here. And these allow us to get a new perspective on the same transformation. For example, we can try to make as many of these mirrors orthogonal as possible. So we could use this gauge to make the gray and the red mirror orthogonal. And then we can use the other gauge to make the red and the blue mirror orthogonal. And when we do, 
we actually learn that any composition of three reflections in the plane can be seen as a translation. We reflect in two parallel mirrors first. We go via the blue mirror to here and via the gray mirror to here, which is a translation. And it's actually a translation along this red line because these mirrors are orthogonal. And then the final transformation is a reflection in this red line. So such a thing is called a footstep reflection or glide reflection. Things get even more interesting when we consider the composition of four reflections. Because when we do four reflections in the plane, we get three of these gauges. So we have a gauge here, we have one here, and we have one here. When we get three of these gauges, we can actually uh, always eliminate two of these reflections. And this is how it works. So we will use this first gauge to make this gray mirror go through this last gauge. And then we will use the uh, rotation point, the last gauge, to make the two gray mirrors be in, uh, incident. So when these two mirrors are the same, what happens is we reflect blue to here, then gray there, the other gray back, and then finally from gray to red here. But this transformation is of course the identity transformation and we can actually make it go away. And so this is how you can understand how the combination of any two rotations in the plane will always just give you a new rotation. You, could, you can always apply this animation that you just saw. You, always, you also have to understand that this is just a way to understand what is going on because the composition operator, which will turn out to be the geometric product, does this completely automatically for you. You don't have to manually do it, it's completely automatic. But when you're lying in your bed at night and you want to figure out what's going on, then this is definitely a good way to look at it. So what have we learned up to now is that all of the transformations in the plane are really just compositions of reflections. And we've learned that there's a maximum number of reflections. If we did four reflections, we could simplify it back down to two. And so in the two-dimensional Euclidean space, the most you can do is three reflections. Right. What we now want is for whatever we do in one-dimensional PGA to be uh, independent of the number of dimensions. And that actually means that we want 2D PGA to be a copy of many versions of 1D PGA. So it pays to take a look at 1D PGA. When we have 1D PGA, that's of course a very simple space. And as far as transformation goes, we only have two things we can do. We can reflect in a point this thing gets reflected over here. And if we do two point reflections, then what we get is a translation. And that's it. As soon as you do three, you can simplify it back down to a single reflection. So I made some little symbols uh, to visualize these operations and we'll keep using them as we move up in dimensions. Um, they're not really symbols, they're just like mini drawings. So a point reflection is obviously just a point and when you do two of them, you get a translation. This is it for one-dimensional PGA. We can visualize all of the elements and the operations using just points. There are only points, point reflections and translations. Now we want this to work for any line in 2D PGA. So if we have two points in the plane, then we all, no matter where they are, we always want these operations to work because when you have two points, there's no way to tell you're in anything higher than a one-dimensional space. Now, of course, in 2D PGA, we will, the basic operation is the reflection in a line, right? Um, and so what we have to do is we have to find this point reflection back. And it's actually quite easy because if you reflect twice in orthogonal lines, you get a point reflection. So you would go from here to here with the first reflection and there to the, with the second reflection is the same as going through this point actually. So this means we can use the composition of two orthogonal lines, two reflections to mean a point reflection. And as we've explained before, if you get two parallel lines, you get a translation. And if you get two uh, intersecting lines, you get a rotation. So we have our reflections. We have our point reflections represented by either orthogonal lines. And we can then of course use the same symbol we were using before. When we compose the parallel lines, we get a translation, which is two parallel lines is the same as the product of two points because, well, we still want one DPGA to work. And those two points were actually two orthogonal uh, intersecting mirrors. And if you compose those, then you also get a, a translation. 
And then the last one, when we compose intersecting lines, we get a rotation. So we can now see that these things that we learned in 1D PGA, they were still valid in 2D PGA because we made this mapping that said orthogonal line reflections are point reflections. And that makes all of these formulas work in two dimensions. So when we go to three dimensions, we basically want the same thing. We have now our planes that will represent the plane reflections and there was no good symbol. So the front slash is the line and the backslash is the plane. When we compose two orthogonal planes, as before, what we get is a line reflection. So this is what we need uh, to represent lines in a way that our 2D PGA formulas will work. And similarly, we will use three orthogonal planes to represent a point, which again we do so that with any line in space, you can use the formulas from 1D PGA. So three orthoplanes, point reflections. These are three orthogonal blue uh, lines. These are two lines, three orthogonal blue planes, two lines or one point, all the same thing. And as before, parallel planes will represent the translation, which is the same as parallel lines, which is the same as the product of two points, which is the same as the product of two of these guys. And as before, two intersecting planes will also represent the rotation, which is the same as two intersecting lines. So as you can see, the transformations of PGA are built up in such a way that it doesn't really matter that you add dimensions as long as you pick the correct representation, being that you need to pick the orthogonal elements to represent the transformations from the space of one dimension less. And if you do that, then things will work in a dimension independent way. Now, we've only been talking about transformations, but it's not too hard to see that there is exactly one plane for each plane reflection, one line for each line reflection, and one point for each point reflection. Mm -hmm. And they obviously transform the same way. Plane reflections should transform just like planes, and line reflections should transform just like lines, and so on. So this is the obvious mapping that we will make. We will say that, okay, our points are just going to be our point reflections. Our lines are just going to be our line reflections, and our planes are just going to be our plane reflections. This is a beautiful unification. It means that if you have a line and you sandwich with a line, you do a line reflection. If you have a point, you sandwich with a point, you do a point reflection. Similarly for a plane. So all of these elements are also trivially their own inverse. They're all reflections. If you repeat a line reflection twice, you get back to the same point. If you do a point reflection twice, you get back to the same point. And similarly for a plane reflection. So they are all involuntary and they are all clearly of this uh, geometric number type. We also say they are all invariant under their associated transformations. So that's also really important. The structure of the transformations is uh, pinned down by this desire for it to work independent of the dimensionality of the space you are in. And the elements are added in as the invariance of the transformations. This makes a lot of operations uh, that are difficult in a vector matrix setup extremely trivial and easy. For example, the products of points and lines and planes create the transformations between them. We already saw that the product of two points created a twice the translation between the two points. We've seen that the product between two lines or between two planes that intersect created twice the rotation between them or twice the translation between them if they didn't intersect. And actually with lines when they are skew, so they're not in the same plane, they're not parallel and they don't intersect, then it actually creates a screw motion. And then same thing, you can just multiply planes to find the transformation between them. Of course, we've also seen that it produces twice the transformation. So we will actually quite often need to take the square root of such a transformation. Now, luckily, that is something that's also really, really easy in geometric algebra. When you have one of these by reflections, you can simply add one and normalize to get the square root. And Equally simple, there is a fully qualified logarithm and exponential function. So when you have a rotation of two degrees or 180 degrees, which is then a line reflection, then you can take it to an arbitrary power alpha, any real number power alpha using this formula, which allows you to generate all of the rotations around that. You have two degrees, you take it to the second power, you get four degrees because it's got to be the same as multiplying with it twice. Um, and so these are also available and super easy to calculate. 
All right, to finish off episode one, let's take a look at a classic example. So we are looking at GLU lookat, which is a function that uh, moves a reference frame to a new frame, and the new frame is defined by a new camera position, a new lookat target, and a new up vector. When we start, uh, when we want to do this in PGA, we can start by just assuming the same inputs. So we will call E uh, the I point, that's the point that you are looking at, it's a Euclidean point, an actual point in the plane. We will call C the center, that's the point we want the camera to sit at. And we will call U the up vector, and this is actually in PGA is going to be something called an infinite point, and we'll get into that later too. Um, but it could just as well be a Euclidean point. It's just another point for us right now. And so what we want to do is we want to actually build a transformation that takes our reference frame to our target frame step by step. And so the first thing we'll do is we will take the product of the reference center and the desired center. And we know that this generates a translation with twice the distance. So to get the one we really want, we just take the square root. And this is going to be the translation that moves our reference frame so that the reference center sits on top of the desired center. Of course, we're now not yet looking in the direction of the eye yet. Um, to look in the direction of the eye, what we will do is we will take our reference center and join it with our reference eye point, this gives us a line. And this line, we move with the motor until it is through this C point, and then we take the desired one. So this is another line. So now we have two lines, the line that's our current orientation and the line that we want the orientation we want it to be. And again, we simply take the product, we take the square root and we compose it on top of the transformation we already had. So now at this point, we moved our reference frame to the correct position and it is looking at the correct eye point. And all we need, we did this one with a product of two points and we did this one with a product of two lines. And we now have one degree of freedom left, which is the up vector. We can still rotate the camera around this line uh, and th this is still a valid degree of freedom. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take our reference center, our reference eye, and our reference up point, make them into a plane. And we do the same thing with the target ones and basically repeat the same operation again. So this is our reference plane moved with the current rotor, taking the product with the desired plane, and then just taking the square root and adding in the motor we already had. And there's a lot of structure here, a lot more than there was here, because here we had cross products and direct filling in of matrix coefficients and whatnot. And what we basically get here, you can see that these references are really constants. So we could replace them with R1, R2 and R3. And then we can write the entire algorithm uh, the way we do here. We start from an identity motor uh, and we start from empty space. This is the pseudo scalar. Uh, we update our space by taking the first point and then we compare that to the first reference. We add in another point, do it with the second reference, add in a third point, do it with the third reference and so on. The advantage here is that it is manifestly uh, dimension agnostic. If you have two points, you use it in 2D. If you have three points, you use it in 3D. If you have four points, you use it in 4D. But the, the formula will always be the same. It'll first align a point, and then it'll align a line, and then it'll align a plane, and then it'll align a volume, and so on. And on top of the fact that it now works in any number of dimensions, all of these guys can also be either Euclidean points or infinite points. So the GLU version explicitly requires the I point to be given as a Euclidean point and the up vector to be given as a pure vector. Um, but our version, you can actually pick. You could give the up vector as a Euclidean point or the I as a direction and so on. So you can mix and match as much as you want. It is also quite clear that this thing is much more generally applicable than just to align camera frames because we are simply aligning point and direction sets. So one point and direction set to another point and direction set, and you can use that for all types of applications where this is relevant. If you look at it in code, it's really as small as it is here and much smaller than the GLU lookat implementation, despite the fact that it is much more flexible. 
So you can see it running here and how it moves the reference position into the desired position, the desired center, looking at the desired eye and with the desired up point. And just to show you that the up point can be a Euclidean point, that's exactly what I did here. So if we move our camera around, it will nicely rotate around this point. All right, that's it for the first episode. Leo will now take you to, uh, through some of the algebraic details and if after the course you are eager for more, we have a website called bivector.net that is collecting all things geometric algebra. All right, thank you. But also the transformations. Welcome back to the second part of the series of talks about uh, PGA. I will now show you some algebra after uh, Stephen has given you an impression of the geometry in the first talk. Uh, this one is called the attack of the mirrors because mirrors will turn out to be central to the way we look at things. The uh, PGA, at the end of the talk, you will realize that all the elements that you like to be available, the planes, the lines, the points, but also the transformations, motors, uh, we call My name is still Stephen. of translators and rotators, reflections, everything is present in a unified framework um, which not only is has the present but also integrates the object and the operators. You will see in grey that uh, a lot of familiar but rather specialized geometrical representations like Blücher coordinates, Lie algebra, homogeneous coordinates are just naturally embedded. Um, but we will see that it's done in a very real and understandable manner despite the fact that let's say dual quaternions are also included and we have the pleasure to say that that empowers the programmer um, and really once you get and dig this way of thinking about things and expressing them um, we hope that you will agree uh, that you are able to do things that you you didn't dare to do before it's not only pretty it's also frugal and efficient uh, Stephen showed you some of that and, uh, well, we happen to think it's fun. So the sections in my talk are uh, that we are first talking about mirrors, then we're talking about operators and objects and their relationship. We'll do a little bit of interpolation. I'll show you how orthogonal projections are included and then hope to summarize with that. It just seems to be just right when you look at it this way. So it's all done with mirrors. We are going to develop an algebra to support what Stephen uh, explained. So we are going to talk about planes as the basic elements of this algebra. They will actually be represented as vectors, uh, but that doesn't need to concern us just yet. Um, we're going to set it up in such a way that the formula for representing one plane, this red plane, in this yellow plane to become this blue plane will take a form like this. It'll be a sandwich product with a yeah, sort of unknown product that is defined by the functionality we desire from it. Uh, so here I take the element x, I sandwich it between a and its inverse, uh, I plug a minus sign into it, and this is my reflection formula. Now, like I said, we're going to take this as the core of our need to define a proper product that helps us do this. Uh, but you immediately see that if I would plug in uh, the mirror A itself instead of the X, then whatever A, A inverse means, it should be 1. So I get minus A. And that means that apparently we have an oriented geometry. We have not only planes, but we have planes that have sides. And the mirror A with its shiny side on this side, if you reflect it in itself, its shiny side gets to the other side. And this is what the minus means. <coughs> And gradually, as you start working through this, you find that this product is not that exceptional at all. It's just a bilinear product, so bilinear in each of its terms. Uh, we're going to assume associativity, so you don't have to worry about brackets. Uh, we should say it's not generally commutative, because otherwise this formula would be rather uh, trivial. And uh, we'll have to say that a plane squares to a scalar. In fact, it's one of those geometric numbers that Stephen was talking about uh, that have a positive square. Now, of course, you already know how to represent planes if you do homogeneous coordinates. Um, you're used to having to store 
the n-dimensional normal vector uh, and some kind of a scalar number which indicates how far it is from the origin. And basically in PGA we do exactly the same thing. So our plane vector is going to be an n of unknown dimensionality and a bit of something else which uh, reflects the distance to the origin uh, and this something else we give a special name, we call it E. As we work through this, uh, we find that it is very convenient to define, to define E squared to be zero. So it's again one of those geometric numbers and in formula after formula we will find out that this is actually like the plane at infinity and you sort of see that here. If I uh, let D the delta become very big, so I have a plane at very large distance from the origin, then this term dominates, and so E is like a plane at infinity. Now you may see PGA denoted as R D comma zero comma one, and that means that there are D positive dimensions. These are the dimensions that correspond to the Euclidean part uh, of the uh, the normal vector that characterizes the plane. That we don't do negative vectors, we don't need them in PGA, and we have one vector that squares to zero, uh, one basis vector, and that's the plane at infinity. And what we will be working in, of course, our illustrations will be mostly d equals 2 and 3, but it will actually work in arbitrary dimensions. All right, immediately we see that uh, the algebra gives encodes for some geometrical relationships. So if I take a plane that is perpendicular to a plane A, so the geometry is B is perpendicular to A, then by this reflection operator we see that oh, this is a plane, if I reflect it in plane A, it, it stays itself. right? So we should have this equation and uh, yeah, if I multiply on the right by A, then that means AB equals minus BA. So the algebraic anti-commutation relationship between two planes reflects their geometric orthogonality. And this happens again and again. So we, we find that these things that we'd like to talk about in geometry have a very simple and clean representation for the geometric product, which is of course why the product is called geometric. Um, and in several of the uh, derivations that I will do in the following, this especially holds for the uh, coordinate planes. Let's see what E1 is. E1 is a plane that passes through the origin because there's no delta and its normal vector is in the E1 direction. This is the coordinate plane with a normal vector in the E2 direction. And if I swap them in the product, then I get a minus sign because they are orthogonal. Um, let's also include that special plane E in this, uh, make it orthogonal to all the other planes. And let's make, uh, of course, identical planes commute. E1, E1 will always be E1, E1. Well, with these rules, we will be able to compute uh, the product of planes. <clears throat> and what do we hope to get out of multiplying planes? Well, this again is given by repeated application of the reflection operator. You saw Stephen do it. Uh, let's now use our new formula to, to see what would happen. So if we have something that first reflects in a plane A1, and then in the plane A2, then because of the associativity of the geometric product, I can bunch these things together. Uh, the inverse of uh, two elements is the inverse of the product of the elements in opposite order, right? If you, if you first put on your socks and then your shoes, then if you want to reverse that, you first you take your shoes off and then your socks off. Um, then we see that there's a new element that occurs in a group, A1, A2, um, multiplying from right to left, that occurs twice. I have a new sandwich product and this should be, we know this from the geometry that Stephen showed, well if the two planes were parallel it should be a translation operator, if the two planes uh, intersected in a line it should be a rotation around that line. So just by continuing this original scheme that we had of the sandwiching, we find these elements in our algebra that should be the translation and the rotation operator. Uh, these are of course going to be our basic motions when we do Euclidean motions and uh, we're going to combine them, it's good to have a name for them, we call them a motor because they move things. Motors are the computational elements of the plane-based geometric algebra right? and so we don't have objects yet but at least we have general motions. 
of a Euclidean kind. So in our total scheme, uh, we have now seen the vectors, or we'll call them grade one elements, because they consist of only one vector, which has the plane and the infinite plane and used as a plane reflector. And we're now beginning to see that if we take combine two of those, um, two of those reflections or four of those reflections, we may get more general elements. But we still have a lot to discover in this total scheme. Let's look at what it actually looks like. So I'm going to uh, do this in a slightly general form. I'm not going to choose coordinates or anything like that. I just say I have two parallel planes, so they have the same n, but they may have different distances to the origin, you know, delta 1 and delta 2. I use the geometric product in precisely the way that I might expect to do with a bilinear product. So if I have terms like this, I first do the, multiply this and that and that and that, and I get four terms. Now this first term I recognize because n times n, uh, I said that the same as n dot n, it's one because I am using normalized normal vectors. This thing, well, e n and n e, they are just one of those orthogonal things. So I, e n is minus n e. So this actually becomes one total term that combines in this manner. And here, if I imply the n e equals minus e n, I get an e squared, and I know that e squared equals zero, so this term disappears. Wow, wait a minute, what is this? This is the, the normal vector times the distance between the two. Okay, we know that that's twice the translation vector that we're expecting, so let's call the translation vector t. And I have now, for the first time, a view of what the product of two planes looks like. This is a translation motor. And it has this form, it has a scalar, and it has a, a grade 2 object, the product of two vectors. And for future references, I can even rewrite this in an exponential form. This is a bit silly, because I'm including terms that are 0, because e squared equals 0. But if I do that, then I can write this as an exponential. Uh, we'll do that to combine it nicely with rotations a bit later. And now you see that the internal algebra of this uh, scheme that I'm setting up also has the consequence that if I do one translation and I do another translation after it, then the total motor that I get is the product of these two. And again, when I expand out all the terms that I get, I see that I get an E squared term that I don't see. And the only thing that is left is that the product of two translations is also a translation, but the vector that it translates over is the vector sum of their two parameterizations two translation vectors. So the algebra automatically becomes completely correct for something like translations, precisely because I have dared to take this geometric number that squares the zero. Okay, let's see what happens to rotation operators. Now, here I'm going to choose uh, special coordinates to make my computation a little bit easy, but I know that I can use translation motors to bring it anywhere. Uh, so this is not a restriction, but I'm taking a P1 equals E1, P2 a rotated version over E1. I'm expecting half the rotation angle to play a role to get a full rotation over phi, so I've encoded that in here. And now I do exactly the same kind of geometric product that I did before, um, and I find that it simplifies in a different way. I again get something that squares to a scalar, so I get a scalar term, and I can get something that is e1, e2, which is one of those grade 2 terms. But I already know from Steven's talk that I may expect that the product of two orthogonal planes, which is what e1 and e2 are, uh, should be a line. And so I might dare to write this as cosine phi minus L times sine phi over 2. Um, if I can convince myself that uh, this is indeed the rotation line. And then I can even write it in this form. What do I need to do that? Well, you've seen this before, maybe with complex numbers, and then there was an i here that squared to minus 1. So I'm allowed to do this algebraically if this thing squares to minus 1, but it does. So I have a, a real line here, the intersection of two planes, e1 and e2. I multiply it by itself, e1 and e2. I know that if I swap these two, I get a minus sign, and then I have e1 squared, e2 squared. I know that each of those are normalized, so they square to 1. So indeed, my l squared is minus 1, and I am allowed to write this expression. Now, this 
is really very pleasant because there is an arbitrariness in the two planes that define the rotation, that is that gauge freedom that Stephen was talking about. But I have now managed to get a representation of these planes, of the rotation operator, that only talks about the line it rotates around and the angle by which it rotates. This is, of course, very, very pleasant. You know, we, and I have now chosen my coordinate system that the line passes through the origin, but we'll see with a little bit of reasoning that uh, actually th I have chosen my origin to make this computation simple, but it works for any line because I could have chosen the origin anywhere. All right, so we'll, we obviously now need to talk about that line a bit more because we're very interested in having that as an object. And uh, the line common to two planes is a bivector. Uh, how would I construct that in general? I've seen that I can do it if I have two orthogonal planes. What if my planes are not orthogonal? Well, you can easily derive that AB and BA are both invariant under the uh, rotation operator made out of the two planes, AB and BA. And uh, I also want the line to have an orientation so that rotating from A to B would be in an opposite sense to rotating from B to A. So I'm interested in the anti-symmetric combination of these two things, and this is indeed precisely how it is defined in the PGA. Uh, we define a new product, which is a linear combination of just geometric products, so it's not really that new, um, as uh, A wedge B. It's the intersection of the two lines, so we call it a meet product, or an outer product, or a wedge product, there are different names there. And you see that A wedge A equals zero, so it has some, some very special properties. Now, if you do that for general planes, then you'll find that uh, you get development of E1, E2, then delta times E, other things here. You get three terms that indi together indicate the direction of the line, and you get three terms that together indicate where the line is. And in fact, this wedge product is just our way of encoding what you may know as Plücker coordinates of lines, the six-dimensional representation of lines. But it's fully embedded in the algebra so far because it is a linear combination of geometric products. Okay, well, Stephen said that if you have three orthogonal planes, that is, uh, that determines a point reflector and therefore it determines a point. <coughs> that is true too uh, if you take the wedge product, if the planes are, planes are not totally orthogonal. Let's develop a simple example of what a point looks like in geometric algebra by taking a coordinate plane in the E1 direction shifted over X1, over E2 in the direction X2, over the amount X2, and E3 over the amount X3. You then fully multiply all these things and you see that you get something that is E1, E2, E3 minus <coughs> a term that I can factorize something out of just to show that the position vector that you're usually using to encode this thing is still present, of course, in the PGA representation. Now, there's two special things in here. This is the product of the three coordinate planes. We are on 3D. <clears throat> and there's the product of the three coordinates plane and the plane at infinity. These will occasionally occur in the rest of my presentation. We'll call this O because it's the point at the origin, obviously, when x equals zero. And we call this I. Uh, that's a common term for the, the biggest element that you can make in a space, the pseudoscalar. But in here you see that on a somewhat weird basis, this one, this one, this one, and this one, this point just has the coordinates 1, x1, x2, x3. So it's homogeneous coordinates. But now, not completely isolated from the operations, because it's actually a reflector, which is actually the intersection of three planes. Um, and because it is so integrated in the total system, you can make the point reflector as reflecting something like minus x, y, uh, x inverse, with x a point. Now, I've now given you enough information to see that we can fill all the elements that we could make from an original basis of a scalar, the uh, three Euclidean vectors, the special vector, which is denoted E0 here. Uh, we naturally get things that are E2 wedge E3, so bivectors. We get things that are bivectors that involve that special thing uh, E. 
uh, we have seen the tri vectors occurring in the points, and we have also seen that in the representation uh, the four element vector uh, occurs. So on this whole basis, we can group things together in different ways to actually have lines, points, planes, even screws, as we'll see. Uh, we have rotation operators, translation operators, they can be combined to motors. We have the plane reflectors and the point reflectors. Everything is integrated in this one rather small, you know, okay, 16-dimensional for a three-dimensional space, but we completely recognize that all these things we need, and it's even nice to see that they slightly overlap. That overlap is not a bug, it's actually a geometrical relationship between these things. You can multiply two points. All right, so I focused it a little bit on translations and rotations separately. You can multiply these together, and we have seen that Stephen showed us that we can expect that this simplifies to, you know, if you apply 100 of them together, you will still get something that is not more than, let's say, a rotation along uh, around a line for a bit of translation along that line. Um, this is all true, and it can be proved. Actually, what we get is dual quaternions. But dual quaternions as motors uh, are not mystically complex dimensional things that occur from somewhere that were given to us by mathematics. No, we've seen that they are just repeated reflections in planes, uh, in an even number of planes if you have a motor. And moreover, our representation of the motions is not totally disjunct from our representation of the things that we'd like to move because we can apply them to any element by this sandwiching. And there are indeed some special cases. If you're in two, at one point in 3D, then you get quaternions. If you're at one point in 2D, then actually they are the same as complex numbers. If you are without rotations in n dimensions, then you actually have something that is like position vectors. Uh, all of these things are totally integrated and recognizable. And this is that property that is really at the basis of why GA programs are so simple. As long as I build things from geometric products, then it's obvious that if I define the transformation of such a composite object by, well, first uh, transform one and then multiply it with the transform of the other, then these things in the middle cancel. So I never have any issue of how I constructed this object. It will always transform by a sandwiching product. And that explains why in uh, the code for transforming a point, a direction, a line with whatever motor you have, whether it's a translation, rotation, or combined, the program is just always m times p times the inverse of m, which is indicated with the twiddle here because uh, we usually normalize these things so we don't have to compute inverses either just to reverse their order this simplifies code of course enormously because i wouldn't even have to write this code i just write this in my program as long as i can read that this geometric algebra i'm allowed to do so it doesn't affect the readability <clears throat> i want to say something about interpolation of motion um, we have seen that uh, the exponential of a line uh, with its angle gives us a rotation operator and that this line is actually the invariant of the motion that we do. We can write any motor as the exponential of the bivector thing, the, the two element thing, the intersection here, that, keep, that it keeps invariant. And this is a general principle but we can also invert it. So if we have a motor we can retrieve the thing that it rotates around, the direction it translates in, or the combination of the two. And that means that if we want to do motions partially, we can just interpolate them by taking the nth root of the motor, which is you know, taking the logarithm uh, divided by n and re-exponentiating. And this is very convenient because the space that I get of these bivectors that characterize the invariance is actually a flat linear space. So, if I have a sequence of poses that I want to visit, I extract their bivectors, I do some kind of an interpolation between these bivectors to make a smooth curve in bivector space, like a spline, and then I re-exponentiate the intermediate bivectors that I get, and that gives me uh, full control 
over a smooth motion that I had in between. And uh, Stephen has done some uh, uh, simulations to show that this way of doing it via a logarithm gives you much, much better behavior than weird things like Euler angles with all their discontinuities, uh, than even quaternion interpolation, which is closely related but not quite doing the log, and something that's called Cayley interpolation, which is a, a, a somewhat simplified form of that. Effectively, what we're doing is interpolating in the Lie algebra, but notice that we don't need special mathematical terms to describe what we're doing, because it's ab absolutely straightforward. All right, so we'll find that uh, once you work with motions, uh, these bivectors will play a very important role. And we're going to see that in uh, the fourth talk as well, where um, physical motion, dynamic motion of heavy things, not all equally heavy in the same direction, etc., uh, will very heavily depend on the bivector part of the geometric algebra. All right, so I've focused now on motions, but maybe you also want to do more general things. Um, there is another part of the geometric product. We've seen that the wedge product, which uh, intersected planes, is something that uh, involved the asymmetric combination, anti-symmetric combination of geometric products. If you take the symmetric combination, which is obviously the other part, uh, you get a familiar friend. It's a dot product. So this is capable of measuring um, length and measuring the cosine of the angle and things like that. By a little bit of effort, you can extend this to act between arbitrary elements of the algebra. Um, and again, it's not a new product. Everything is still writable as the sum of geometric products, and therefore everything still transforms in the same way. That's very handy. And now we get a general projection formula where you take an element x, uh, you want to project it onto an element a, and what you do is x dot a with this new dot product divided by a. And it has a satisfying interpretation. So here I have a red plane and a red point. If I project the point onto the plane by x dot p divided by p, uh, I get indeed the blue point that you expect. But what you maybe had not expected is that if you project the point on the, the plane onto the point, I get this blue plane, which actually is the plane passing through the point parallel to the original one. And this also works for lines, so the red line can be projected on the red plane by uh, this formula, L dot P divided by P, uh, but the plane can also be brought into coincidence with the line by P dot L divided by L. In fact, we get a completely coordinate free relationship. As soon as we have two objects, they sort of divide the space into parallel, coincidence, orthogonal things that are all very simply encodable by little formulas that do not depend on splitting them into where they are and in which direction they are. It all works like this. Uh, the intersection point we've seen before is just PHL, of course. So this is handy. Um, it's handy language to think in, and it's a handy language to use. What we have when we have projections is that if you think about what matrices or linear mappings do, is that uh, a matrix can be written as how, how things behave when they are projected on uh, certain basis elements, how much they extend, etc., and then recompose them. So that means that with the projection, we also have any general linear operator, but now in a much more pleasant setting in which um, everything we make transforms according to the motions of the space we're interested in. So uh, any linear operation is also available, but it is definitely a good habit that if you have a special set of motions that you're interested in, in our case the Euclidean motions, you go to an algebra in which these motions become motors, these exponentials of bivectors. Um, and that automatically has a consequence of the space that you're looking at. So we have seen that for the Euclidean PGA, when we take planes as vectors, we get motors that do Euclidean transformations. If you go to, say, spheres as vectors, you get conformal transformations because there are multiple reflections in spheres. And each of the different algebras that we have already developed or seen develop in the field uh, have their own way of making a certain group of motions really simply representable. 
All right, so the summary is that uh, I hope you are becoming convinced that this is the right way of doing it, that all these old ways we had are certainly incorporated, you don't have to forget about them, it's just that they are now in interrelated and they are at your fingertips because of the very simple way in which they are included. Geometric products, dot products, wedge products, logarithms, exponentials, those are the basis for developing your code. Um, the code is also very efficient because basically you are still juggling coordinates around, except not at the level of where you're programming. If you like that table, uh, we have a mug that we can sell you that uh, contains it. Um, and uh, Stephen has built uh, quite a collection of things, which is called the uh, Ganja Coffee Shop, in which uh, uh, things are available online. Here you see a link with a, quite a library of uh, operations that uh, you might want to do uh, that each have their own individual uh, programs and things. Here's the 3D PGA. Uh, one of the things, for instance, is uh, I give the link to here. This is the interpolation, the nice interpolation between two extremal rotations of a rod where classically you get a candy wrap phenomenon if you don't do it carefully enough. But of course, uh, in the geometric algebra interpolation, you get a much more smooth way of doing that. And this concludes this part of the presentation. Okay, so let's make a 10 minute break and see you next for the uh, episodes uh, three and four. Hello, this is Leo again with the fourth talk in this series. Uh, we're now going to Newtonian... name is still
Hi everyone, welcome back. Now we will watch the episodes three and four of the tutorial on plane based geometric algebra. And this is still the SIP Grapi 2021 course on the plane based geometric algebra. We're now at episode three titled Revenge of Infinity. Let's start with a small recap of what we've been doing up to now. So we've been looking at the Euclidean group, all of the distance preserving transformations as the set of all K reflections. We've seen that orthogonal K reflections, also known as K blades, are the invariants of those transformations and are ideal to represent our points, lines, planes, the elements of Euclidean geometry. We've also seen that we can compose these elements to get transformations between them product of two points gave a translation, a product of two planes gives a rotation or a translation and so on. And we've seen that we can exponentiate these elements, take them to arbitrary powers. If you uh, repeat two, a two degree rotation twice, you get a four degree one and so on to get transformations around those elements. We may have given you the impression that the Euclidean group holds all of the elements in PGA, but that's not entirely true. So there are, we might have left out some line and a couple of points and that's what we'll look at in this particular episode so we'll be talking about infinity how it leads to duality um, how duality leads to orientation and how all of it leads to forks let's get started like leo taught you in the previous episode to model the 2D Euclidean geometry, we will actually use a three-dimensional vector space. So that's what we're rendering here. This is the origin of our three-dimensional vector space, and this is the projective plane in which we will be doing Euclidean geometry. We want to represent our reflections and our point reflections as lines and points in this plane, and we will do so by representing lines as a plane through the origin in three dimensions. So you can imagine that if you take any line in the plane here, that you can always construct this plane through the origin. And in fact, when you do, and you take the entire set of those planes, you would have almost all of the planes through the origin, but not all of them, because there is of course one plane that doesn't cut the projective plane. So it cannot be associated with a, a Euclidean line, with a line in this Euclidean plane. What we'll do instead is we will associate it with an infinite line. Similarly, when we are representing points as by reflections, orthogonal by reflections, you can see this as every point in the plane being represented by a line in three dimensions through the origin. And as before, we could take all of the points in the plane, construct all of these lines, and we would get a set of lines through the origin that is almost complete. But it isn't complete. To make it complete, we also have to include all of these lines that do not cut the projective plane. And all of these lines will actually be associated with infinite points in two dimensions. So why would you want to do this? Well, it, uh, it, makes, uh, it makes it so that when you do an intersection query that you always get an answer. So if we are intersecting this blue line and this red line, we intersect the planes instead. Since these two planes go through the origin, they will always intersect and they intersect in this orange line. And this orange line is now the representation of the intersection point of the red and the blue one. So if the orange line cuts the projective plane, it does so exactly where the red and the blue one cut. And if it doesn't cut the projective plane, it's that exact point at infinity where the red and the blue line uh, still intersect. So parallel lines intersect at infinite points and you always get an answer. So that's one nice feature that you get when you add these elements at infinity. But it is not the only one. Um, these infinite elements also enable duality. So remember that we just counted all of the planes through the origin and we associated each plane through the origin either with a Euclidean line, if it intersected, or with the infinite line, the one plane that didn't intersect. So we can actually say that there, if we take the number of Euclidean lines and we add one, then we get the exact number of planes through the origin. And similarly, with the lines through the origin, we did the same thing. We associated every single line through the origin, either with the Euclidean point, if it intersected the projective plane, or with an infinite point, if it didn't intersect the projective plane. Now, of course, for 
there are just as many planes through the origin as there are lines through the origin. You can easily see this because every plane has a normal vector and you can associate that normal vector with a line. And so you have this unique map between planes and lines. But by adding the infinite elements, we actually make these counts the same too. So there are just as much Euclidean plus infinite lines as there are Euclidean plus infinite points. And because we have the same amount, we can now make a map. We can make a map that associates a Euclidean or infinite line with a Euclidean or infinite point. And this map is actually called the duality map. It works both ways. And so how does it work? Let, let me show you. We can take this green point. We can construct the line through the origin. We can construct a plane orthogonal to it and see where that plane cuts the projective plane. And so what we now get is this green line. And these elements are in a duality relation. So the green line is the dual of the green point, and the green point is the dual of the green line. Now let's do that for a second point. So we take this purple point, construct the line, construct the orthogonal plane, and see where it cuts the projective plane. So we now have these two lines, these two dual lines, the purple line dual to the purple point, the green line dual to the green point. Now what we want to do is we want to look at this intersection point of these two lines and do the same construction. So we want to construct the dual of this intersection point and see what happens. So when we do this, we will see that the dual of the intersection point is actually the line that connects the two original points. And this is, this is really great because it means if you have a piece of code that can calculate this intersection point, then you can use this duality map and use the same piece of code to calculate the connecting line. So this really says, okay, if I want to find this, this line, then what I can do is I can dualize these both points. I can then take the intersection. And when I do, I will find the dual of the connecting line. And you can actually do this with any code you write in PGA. Uh, if you describe your code and it says something like, oh, this is the join between two points, then you could swap join and meet, and you can swap point and line, and you will get a, a new interpretation for the exact same piece of code. Again, keep in mind that this duality relation only exists because we add these elements at infinity. Right? If we don't add these elements at infinity, then there's not as many lines as there are points, and you can't make this one-to-one -one mapping. There is one last thing that these infinite elements do, and that is they unify rotation and translation. We've learned before that a translation is a reflection in two parallel mirrors, but you can actually also see it as a rotation around a point at infinity. And so, because we have these infinite elements, we can actually see rotations and translations as the same thing. These are the three superpowers of our infinite elements. So they enable exception-free intersections. They enable duality, which then unifies this meet and join. And they unify the rotations and the translations. But duality is something that actually um, will spend some more time because it also plays an important role when we are talking about dimension independence as we did before in part one. So what I have here is a two-dimensional drawing. Well, I actually have two. I have a robot arm on the left and I have a floor plan on the right. And both of these drawings consist out of points and lines. Here are points on the corners and the lines connecting them. And so if you have a piece of code that, that makes these drawings, um, you would really have no reason to have two different functions to create points um, or two different functions to create lines. But when you start thinking about dimension independence, the picture sort of changes. Because if we want to make a 3D version of this robot arm or of this floor plan, then we actually want completely different behavior. When we move the robot arm to 3D, we want points to stay points and lines to stay lines. But when we move the floor plan to three dimensions, that's not what we want. We want these lines to become our walls, so they need to become planes. And we want these points to become lines. And so here, we want the types of the elements to stay the same. And here, we want the types of the elements to switch. And we can actually uh, quite easily do it, right? We could here define our points as d-vectors and our lines as the joints of two points. 
And here we can define our lines as one vectors and our points as the meet of two of these lines. So here you get join lines, here you get direct lines, here you get direct points, and here you get meet points. And of course, these uh, situations commonly occur both at the same time. So when we implement this, we can implement it in 2D, and if we pick our types correctly, we'll actually be able to move it to three dimensions. So this is something extra that, that shows up when you want to be dimension independent. And I know what you're thinking, yeah, I'm just going to work in three dimensions, so it's, it's not going to make a difference for me, and I don't need these two types of approaches. But there's actually more to it. And to find out what, we will have to take a closer look at orientation. And so let us first define what we actually mean by orientation, because there are two completely different types of orientation. One is extrinsic orientation and the other is intrinsic orientation. Extrinsic orientation tells you how the space around your element is oriented. For a plane, that means it tells you which half of space is the up half and which half is the down half or the front half and the back half and so on. Um, the other type of orientation tells you how the space inside your element is oriented. So for a plane, it means it's either going clockwise or it's going counterclockwise. And this actually is some, a property that exists for all types of elements. So for a line, it is intrinsically oriented when it goes from one end to the other or from the other end to one uh, end. And it is extrinsically oriented if it rotates the space clockwise or counterclockwise around it. For points, they're a bit degenerate. The situation is a bit different. You're always on the outside and you have these two types of uh, spin that make up the intrinsic rotation. Now, why is this so important uh, that you distinguish these two types of orientation? Well, when you reflect them, they behave differently. So if we reflect in a mirror that is parallel with our element, then extrinsic orientations, they will swap uh, their sign. So they, the up arrow becomes a down arrow, the clockwise rotation becomes a counterclockwise rotation. For intrinsic oriented elements, when you reflect parallel to the element, the orientation stays the same. So here when we do this reflection, we're still moving in the same direction, and here we're still rotating uh, in the clockwise direction. And the opposite thing happens when you reflect in an orthogonal mirror. So if you reflect in an orthogonal mirror, it is the extrinsic orientation that stays the same, and it is the intrinsic orientation that flips. Now, when you want to create, uh, let's say, a line, you will want to either create a line with an intrinsic orientation or a line with an extrinsic orientation. And this is exact that same dual two ways of defining elements that we had before. When we create our lines by joining two points, we either join the blue point to the green one or the green one to the blue one, and this will uh, trivially determine this intrinsic direction. And the same thing, thing happens when we uh, create a line by meeting two planes. So let, imagine that these are at a little angle, so you have this intersection line in between here. Then it would be oriented one way if we intersect blue with green, and it would be oriented the other way if we intersect green with blue. So these types of orientations are intricately connected with the way that you create them. The intrinsic rotations are created by joining elements and the extrinsic rotation orientations are created by meeting elements. So we will call these meet orientations and these join orientations. We'll call these join lines and these meet lines. And that'll be an important concept to keep in mind. It is particularly important, and all of the concepts that I've talked about uh, in this episode are particularly important if we want to have a dimension-independent geometric treatment of dynamics. And so that's what we'll talk about now. Uh, let's first sort of uh, make a little overview of what we want. We want rigid body kinematics and dynamics in any number of dimensions. We, of course, want this unification of rotation and translation. But we also want to unify all of these other uh, concepts from classical mechanics, force and torque, mass and inertia, linear and angular momentum, linear and angular acceleration and velocity. So this first one, we've already figured out how to do that, right? To unify rotation and translation, what we need are these infinite elements. And we know when we 
add these infinite elements, we can view translations as rotations around infinite points. And we already know we can represent all of these as 2K reflections um, in parallel or uh, intersecting planes. Um, and that will, will give us all of the rotations and the translations. So what we'll look at next is the unifications of force and torque and mass and inertia. And we will introduce a concept called inertial, inertial duality to do that. So classically, uh, forces are those things that generate linear motion and torques are those things that generate angular motion. Now, when we look at how, what it looks like in PGA, it looks like this. So if we push a box at its center of mass, then we cause a translation. If we push it at infinity, we actually cause a rotation. If we push it at an arbitrary point, we cause a little bit of a combination of both. Uh, but what's important here is to note that these forces that are causing these motions, both the translations as well as the rotations, are always just forces along lines, right? So we don't need a force couple to generate a rotation, we just need to push at infinity. Um, and that is uh, an important concept because this idea that forks are uh, lines actually uh, holds in any number of dimensions. But they are not just lines, uh, they're actually dual to one another. Um, so remember that uh, when we were talking about duality, uh, the infinite lines were associated um, with the planes that, don't, that didn't cut the origin. Um, and so they are the, the line that is normal to that plane is exactly above the origin. And so this is a local relationship. When you push at infinity, you rotate around your center of mass. And so this is the origin of the box. If you have two boxes and you're pushing at infinity, then each box would rotate around its own center of mass. So let's look at that in three dimensions. Um, and here we can again see the same idea. If you are pushing at the origin, you're creating a rotation at infinity. If you push at infinity, you create a rotation around the origin. And if you push at an arbitrary position, you will get a rotation here. Uh, but in all of the cases, this green line and this uh, orange line, they are each other's dual. Um, so here we're pushing at the origin and the dual line will be at infinity. Here we're pushing at infinity and the dual line will be through the origin. And if we push at an arbitrary uh, point in space, the dual line will, will be here. So these guys, they are always join lines. A force is a join line, which is really easy. You just take the point you want to apply it to and you take a line through it and that represents your force. And then if you dualize it in the body frame, you will actually get the center of motion that this force uh, causes. The, motion, the force causes a, an acceleration and the acceleration will have an, an axis and that's actually just the dual. So this is a tremendous simplification for the treatment of inertia. Now, when you want to do uh, full inertia, we will also we will require our object to be to have the center of mass at the origin and to be aligned with the principal moments of inertia. And then it's actually a dual map and some additional scaling. You can find all of the details in the papers. Right, so this uh, gets us to the point where we can make a complete overview of what rigid body dynamics will look like, what a geometric picture is if you do it in a dimension independent fashion. And then in the next episode, Leo will go into the algebra of all of this. And in episode six, we will actually implement a simple rigid body dynamics engine together in PGA. But first the overview. So we've just seen that forks those are the lines you push along and accelerations. Those are the meat lines that you uh, rotate around. They are each other's dual. So this classic way of formulating that relation, which actually uses a cross product. So you're really sure you can only use it in three dimensions. It completely goes away and gets replaced by this concept of inertial duality. Forks uh, get integrated into momenta uh, and accelerations get integrated into velocities. This is the same way as you would classically do it. But again, this classic relationship that relates momentum and velocity gets replaced by the same inertial duality. And then all we need to do, of course, is integrate our velocity into our position. And this is linear and angular combined. So position is really position and uh, rotation. 
Um, and then the geometric picture, uh, we've already said so, uh, the, all of the forks are join lines through the contact point. So you can't, can't have an easier way of doing this than just say, okay, you want to push somewhere, you take that point, you join it into a line with some other point, and this is your force acting at that point in the body. And then if we want to find out the acceleration that is caused by this force, we can just take the dual and we will get a meat line through the motion center. So if we push at infinity, our meat line will be through the origin. If we push at the origin, our meat line will be at infinity, which is exactly what this inertial duality does. When we integrate, for us as programmers, of course, that's just a sum of many small parts. So the momentum is going to be a sum of join lines, which isn't necessarily a line anymore. And the velocity is going to be a sum of meat lines. Then, of course, our position is going to be a motor, a 2K reflection, as we've seen before. This is completely dimension independent. Um, so these join lines will always be D minus one vectors and these hyperlines, uh, because they're not always lines, they're only lines in 3D. So uh, they're meet lines in 3D, they're always meet elements, but they're not always lines. In 2D, they, they will be points, but they will always be uh, by vectors. And this is actually the complete picture. You have a very simple formulation of the Euler equations of motion that uh, Leo will go into. And this is actually valid in any number of dimensions. So uh, that's what we'll be doing in the uh, episode six. Okay, thank you. Uh, we called it the fork. Hello, this is Leo again with the fourth talk in this series. Uh, we're now going to Newtonian dynamics and uh, we called it the fork awakens. You'll see why. I'll uh, have a brief overview of the talk. There'll be two types of lines that we need to talk to about. Uh, Stephen has already mentioned that. We're going to talk about moving heavy things. We're going to use forces, do a bit of differentiation. Well, maybe it's easier to show you the summary of the talk by uh, a little scheme that I've made. So here we have hyperplanes that meet into a hyperline. These are the meat lines that uh, Stephen was talking about. We're going to, and they will determine the rate of motion, the velocities of motion and the acceleration there of this type. And we will be able to connect points with the join operator that gives us a dual type of line, the join line. And this is the way that momentum and forces and torques are encoded in geometric algebra. And there's a duality between the two. So the talk is going to proceed as follows. We have basically done this part in the first piece of my first talk, um, where we talked about planes, meeting them in with lines, uh, characterizing motors with their exponentials with other rates. Then now I'm going to give you a little bit of algebraic detail of how the join lines are represented. We're going to put masses in motion to get the momentum. I will show you how forces and torques are unified. We'll do a bit about time derivatives because obviously that is relevant to see how that is represented in PGA. And then uh, we'll very quickly uh, have the dynamics before we know it actually. Okay, so there were two types of lines. You can meet two planes in a line, um, and these planes can be parallel when the line is at infinity. That's sort of the same thing for us. But you can also connect two points and get a line. And you can connect a point to a direction and get a line. And these are really of different types. Um, this moving along a line is what we need when we talk about momentum. So we have a point and we have another point, we connect them by a joint product. It's slightly more complicated to define and so I won't do it in algebraic detail here. Uh, the important thing to know for the dynamics part is that if you want to make the line from a point X that moves in the direction U, then this becomes the object, the algebraic element U dot X. Now we've seen that points are represented as D vectors, they're the intersection of D planes in a D dimensional space, three and three dimensional space. And if I take a dot product with a vector, I get a two vector in 3D or a D minus one vector in general. And this really is a dual object to a bi vector because I totally have D plus one dimensions as you see here. So 
they're different objects. They're slightly confusing in 3D because they both come out to be bivectors, but um, it is important for the goals that we have for PGA to recognize their difference, and it simplifies the code. Now, Stephen had a picture of uh, the robot on the one hand and the floor plan on the other hand, where he motivated that some of them are l points that generalize from 2D to lines in 3D, and uh, other lines remain lines because they were the robot or they become planes, uh, just to motivate that we bo need both type of lines. Um, this is another illustration of that same fact. As long as you get that, we can proceed. We need them both um, in our algebra, and we have them both. Right. So some of them are the bivectors, and the others are the dual bivectors. Time to put in some mass. So when we have a mass m moving with a velocity v through a point x, then we're going to make a heavy line, a line weighted by the mass, but it's obviously a join line. The point was first here, and then it was, well, x plus x dot further. Um, this evolves with a little bit of algebra to the formula mv dot x. Now mv you recognize, this is the classical momentum of the point, and x you also recognize, it's the point where it happens. But in geometric algebra, this element, this this dual bivector, this join line, contains both of these. It is really a geometric object that indicates both what happens and where it happens. And it turns out that that property of uh, PGA really makes the formulation of the physics aspects a lot more easy than it is in the classical way. Well, at the end, we'll compare them. So. It will be an element of geometry and it makes it coordinate free. Now, if we have several points, then we know that the total momentum should be composed of the momenta of each of these individual things. Um, we will see in a few slides that in PGA, if you have something that moves by a motor, then its time derivative is a commutator product with the bivector of that motor. So, taking that as given for now, you see that we get a total formula here for the momentum, which depends on the rate at which something is moving, the spatial rate in the sense of, you know, the turning axis, the, the uh, shift axis and everything, all encoded by this one bivector B. And this linear function of the bivector <coughs> is called the inertia, the total inertia. Now, you see that this map is rather special. I have taken a bivector, which describes the rate, the exponential of it is the motor, and I have converted it into a join line, which was a dual bivector. So the masses and their distribution, as encoded in this formula, define a duality map in the algebraic sense. They map a, uh, a rate, a velocity, to and momentum. Classically, I always thought that velocity and momentum. Um, that turns out not to be the handy way of thinking about it. This inertia is rather unusual uh, in its properties. Uh, you can, if you have two objects of which you both know the inertia, you can just add them to get the inertia of the total object. Whereas classically, uh, these inertia maps, they do exist, but they are developed relative to the center of gravity of each of the objects, and you need all sorts of rather involved theorems in between to convert it to the total momentum relative to the new center of gravity. In, in C PGA, that's all not necessary. Everything just adds. And the reason is that the position where you had it is encoded in the objects themselves. They are really, truly geometric objects that can be manipulated in geometric ways. So here's that summary again. We, we have two sides. We have a rate, a velocity, which is a bivector, which is a meat line, and the duality map converted into a momentum, which is a join line. And you can say that the rate is you know, how fast things move is, and what the consequence of that movement is for the total movement is kinematics. 
depends on the geometry uh, and the p contains the masses um, and is for the dynamics it depends on the masses <coughs> the uh, map between the two is the inertial duality map and uh, it really is a dual thing you can sort of see that when i represent the by vectors that I'm going to act on in something that has mostly the Euclidean elements and the infinity directions. You know, say if I exponentiate this, I get rotations around the origin. If I exponentiate this, I get translations um, anywhere. Um, and you see from the sort of cross diagonal form that uh, it acts on these and it produces these. It really swaps these things. It makes uh, meet lines into join lines. All right, so let's go to the forces. Now, we have seen momenta are lines because they're a point and where the point is a little while later joined to each other. Uh, we know that in Newton's laws, the force and the momentum, the time derivative of momentum are closely related and indeed forces are also lines. So if I am at a location X and I feel a force F passing through that thing, then I am on the force line F dot X, exactly the same sort of form as the join lines I showed before. Um, but there's something really interesting going on here when you look at the same force from a different point of view. So this force line F dot X was a force passing through the point X. Let's go and stand at a different point Y and let's be interested in seeing what we see, feel over there from the force. Now you see I have this one object f, f dot x. I expand it using this formula that you may or may not remember from the second talk of what a general point looks like. Um, I split that up because I'm very interested to know what I feel at y and indeed I feel the same force f as y. But this geometric fork force thing um, automatically produces something that I would call the torque that I feel at y um, as an infinity term to preserve the geometric object that it really is. So because I'm standing at y, I suddenly feel both a force and a torque, but they are completely unified in the geometric object that is out there in nature that I am subjected to. Now, because the force and the torque are united, uh, we call them fork to indicate that aspect. And so the whole dynamics in PGA will not require you to split these things in forces and torque. You can, if you, if you know where you stand and you want to know what you feel there, you can do it. But nature develops independent of where you are and the fork um, encodes that. All right, we're going to have to go to uh, time dependence. So let's take an object X that moves with a motor relative to some standard object X zero. And you know that that goes like this. We know that the motor is going to be writable as some kind of a bivector that develops in time. Um, and so this combination of forms then determines what the derivative of a motor is. Um, there's an initial motor that I can actually encode in two ways. I can look at the world frame, so I take a pose of an object and I move it afterwards with this time-dependent element. Or I could say, well, you know, start at the standard phase, put it in the right uh, position and, and uh, uh, location that I want to do it, and apply the motor M0 to be where I am. At t equals zero, these are exactly the same sort of thing. But here I have moved in, let's say, the world coordinates, and here I have moved in the body coordinates. As I do the differentiation, you now why is this important? Well, because the geometric product doesn't commute. So if I do the differentiation of this term, I get a BW, and then the same thing that I had. And if I do this differentiation, I get the same thing I had, and then a B body frame. These are two equivalent ways of describing things, and we'll for the rest of the talk, I will concentrate on this way because it leads to slightly easier formulas. But, you know, it's a choice of convenience. All right. 
Now, we have an object X that was produced on an object X0 by a time-dependent motor. What happens if I take a dime differentiation of that? Well, sort of the same thing, you know, if I take a differentiation of this thing, I get the B of the motor out of there, and the rest remains because it's one of those exponential functions, you know, it's B times the exponential. If I then let it act on this, well, that's constant. If I then let it act on the final term, then I again get the whole thing, but I get a B afterwards. And so whatever the motor was, I will always be able to write the time derivative of my x that is moved by a motor as my original x with a combination with the bivector of the motor only. And the combination that is the commutator product is just an anti-symmetric product of a combination of geometric products. So the bivector of the motor completely characterizes at this level what the time derivative is. And so again, like before, we find that this set of bivectors, this actually forms the Lie algebras of the motors, is what is relevant in this, as a tool to describe how things move. Now, Newton simply said that uh, the force is the time derivative of the momentum. Euler said something similar for the uh, rotating motion uh, based on torques. In geometric algebra, they are completely united in saying that the fork is the time derivative of the total momentum, and that will contain both the rotational and the translational aspects. Um, I just don't want to split them anymore. That means we need the time derivative of this thing. Uh, we know that the momentum itself was the uh, inertial map applied to the bivector of the motor. And what do we do when we differentiate? Well, we get a cross B. I just showed that on the previous slide because this is a thing that moves with the motor. Uh, but we're not quite done because the B itself may be uh, changing in time as well. So we also need i on b dot. i is a linear function, so I can pass it through there. And this, surprisingly, is all. We now have fully unified dynamics. We have the equation f equals p dot, which we just derived. What are we interested in? Well, we want a differential equation for how the velocities change. So we want to isolate b dot. That means I have to bring this to the other side and take the inverse of the inertia map on this. So this enables me to say that if you give me the forces and you give me the mass distribution that I want to move, then solve this differential equation to see what its velocities are. And then once I have the velocities, I have this equation in the body frame that allows me to integrate the motor from those given velocities. Uh, so this is the dynamics, there's really mass involved here, and this is the kinematics. And uh, when you write this out, surprisingly, this contains all of the Newton-Euler dynamics, the angular momenta, the linear momenta, all these things are hidden within this if you want to unpeel them, but you don't need to unpeel them. You can immediately apply this equation. And here you see me doing it. So this is, uh, again, uh, one of the Ganja demos. Uh, we have a heavy object under gravity on a hook spring with some damping uh, and it is directly implemented in the way that I just described. So when you look at the code that uh, Steve will also demonstrate in session 6 today, um, you'll see that he will define the gravity, define Hooke's law, define the damping, all in terms of compact join lines of uh, geometric algebra. Um, the total force is then something like this. And the whole equation is that the state of M and B changes by the equation I just showed, where here this bang, is uh, this exclamation point is the, the duality uh, of the object. And you just solve the equation. And so here I show it again. No, this is... Um, very realistic looking motion. Well, yeah, the, where it deviates from reality is by the integration step, but the equations are exactly right to be the physics. 
So here's the overview again that I showed in the beginning. Um, momentum and fork are both join lines. Rate and acceleration are both meet lines. There is a duality map between them. If I give you a force and I give you the mass distribution, then I know this and that. And by navigating this diagram uh, by these two equations, I can get the ultimate motion. Um, and this is not just algebra, this is actually the program to do it. So, in 3D PGA, uh, the dynam in the dynamics, um, the bivectors and the dual bivectors uh, both coincide to be elements of grade 2. This takes a while to uh, be careful with your formulation and pull it apart. It was actually when we looked at how we would do dynamics in 2D that uh, it became most clear that they are two really two different objects. Um, it may be that this confusion, which, you know, I, I have a PhD in physics, I have this cl had this classical mechanics, uh, but I hadn't had this clarity in seeing what made dynamics tick. Uh, this happens for the first time, this eye-opener in looking at the 3D PGA. And um, not only that, it really makes it dimension independent. Stephen will, uh, will actually live program uh, how you do n-dimensional dynamics of uh, a cube on a string in the, under Hooke's law. All right, so to conclude our PGA tour then, let's look how classical mechanics is embedded. Um, and here you see the total picture. So all we have in PGA is that we are talking about the bivector rate of a motion, the body properties encoded in the inertial duality, and then via the momentum couple it to the force. And these are all the symbols we need in the equations. And as you saw from the demo, we can encode and solve these equations. How do you do it classically? Well, you have a fixation about wanting to see rotations as different from translations. That is something that you should have forgotten after the first two presentations of today. You know, translations are rotations too. They're just rotations about a point at the line at infinity. Um, that's a unification. When you do that unification, uh, you no longer have to say, well, you know, this momentum occurs at this point, and if I go to another point, then I need transformation laws, some of which describe the inertia, but this is the change inertia around the new points. No, everything is just I of B. You never have to look at the right side. Similarly, when you look at the momentum, you don't have to say there is a linear momentum and there's an angular momentum, and if I go to a different place, then I keep my linear momentum, but my angular momentum changes because I'm offset off that place, and one of them is relative to the centroid and the other one is to the origin. It also, again, doesn't happen. The magical thing is that if you dot the classical momentum with the point where it happens, and you wedge the angular momentum with infinity, the plane at infinity, then you will get an invariant object, P, which you can immediately integrate without having ever to make that distinction. And yes, linear momentum sort of couples to the force, and yes, angular momentum sort of couples to the torque, but those are unified as well in exactly the same way, and that's why, the, why the, all you need are things on the left. So, very recognizable, and a great pity that we haven't seen this before. PGA, I should say, is not the only framework in which these things are united. Um, the important thing is that you have one six-dimensional space in which the things come together, and there are two things, screw theory and spatial algebra, that do, this, do similar things. Uh, but they really see it as a handy little trick, algebraic vector space that you introduce to make things work. Um, we have seen that once we are in the space of planes, we are in a four-dimensional space, for a 3D uh, encoding, we automatically have a bivector space that is already of the six-dimensional nature, and all the elements and their integration are given for free when we do that. Moreover, if you take the screw theory and spatial algebra approach, you're only talking about motions and never about the objects, except in their inertial properties, whereas we see that by 
you know, the meat product and the joint product, we actually have encoding of the geometric primitives that our emotions can work on. So we get a fully integrated framework, which of course for applications in simulations and computer graphics is very nice that they live in the same space. Um, we uh, have also seen that we can just as easily do d-dimensional uh, kinematics and dynamics as Stephen will show you in the demo. Um, whereas uh, the screw theory and the spatial algebra are very, very specially tailored to the uh, three-dimensional case because their whole representation is uh, hard-coded. All right, well, also here we have uh, demos. Um, I think it is nicer to see Stephen at work actively in producing them uh, so that you can get a flavor of how that works. Uh, we have also modeled contact forces in the same framework. Um, all of these are again clarified by distinguishing the meat lines and the join lines. And uh, a message from our sponsor, uh, if you really want to be part of uh, the PGA crowd then of course you should uh, wear your uh, belief on your sleeves and we provide the tools for that as well. All right. Thank you. Bye. So let's make another break. Uh, see you in 10 minutes for the last two episodes of this tutorial and the uh, questions and answers section. Hello and welcome to episode 6, a new
Hi, uh, welcome back. Now, uh, the last two episodes of the tutorial. Steven, and this is episode 5, A New Hope, of the SIPGRAPI 2021 course on the plane-based geometric algebra. In this episode, we will actually do some programming. Now, I know that everybody of you, when you walk out of this course, will want to get their hands dirty with PGA right away. So I want to point you to some resources and a place that you can go to for more information before we begin. And that would be by vector.net. Um, which is uh, a great website that has an overview of a bunch of geometric algebra libraries. Um, for example, the Klein library is a production-ready C++ library that implements PGA, definitely one worth taking a look at. Um, but you will also find uh, more cool information on byvector.net. There's this little tool step where you can download simple reference implementations for a variety of languages. Look at Cayley tables, evaluate expressions, things like that. There's a forum. Um, there's also a Discord. You can find the link here. Always lots of users online discussing geometric algebra. And if you must, there is also a merch uh, a site where you can get some cool geometric algebra caps or t-shirts and so on. The library we will be using today to do our prototyping is called Ganja.js. Um, and it comes with this little online playing playground. So it's uh, zero install. You can just serve there, browse some examples. Uh, you can modify them, uh, run them in the browser and so on. And that's exactly what we'll be doing today. All right. Before we get into it, um, it's probably a good idea. It'll be very simple what we'll be doing today. So if you have any experience with any C style dialect, you should be fine. Um, but there are, of course, some specifics for geometric algebra, and these are actually uh, sort of uh, the same over most of the libraries that you'll find on Bivector. So when we do, did a geometric product up till now, the mathematical syntax would to just be juxt use juxtaposition. And of course, when we're programming, we're going to use the ordinary multiplication for that. The outer product, luckily, is already a Boolean operator, so you can just overload that one. The regressive product, the V, doesn't really have a nice equivalent where most of the libraries are using the ampersand. For the inner product, we use a uh, dash, uh, uh, a vertical line. For the duality operator, we use the, uh, the binary not operator. And then the sandwich product, we will use the uh, sign adjust right operator. All right, so we will do two little examples, examples in this episode five. Um, first, we will look at some of the very basics and, and some of the methods that you need to work in a dimension independent way by implementing a thin lens example, the paraxial approximation. So given a thin lens uh, with a certain focal distance, uh, find where some source point ends up being focused in the image. Um, and then the second uh, problem that we'll be tackling is a simple inverse kinematic solver. So given a base and a target, calculate all of the joint orientations to get this uh, simple arm to move to the position you want it to move. All right, we will start with a thin lens example. Um, and this is a, a picture I have from a physics Libre text. So it's a sort of classical solution. Um, and this is uh, actually the solution to something called uh, the lens maker equation. It's the simplified version, so the paraxial uh, appro approximation. And um, it'll basically tell you to solve how to solve for these two variables, um, which is basically the distance of the image point and uh, the height uh, of the image point away from the optical axis. Um, so these formulas, obviously, they, they're not very geometric, but they do have some advantages. Um, because of the way it's set up and the way it's parameterized, you can use this as an approximation for thin lenses in two dimensions, as in the picture, for a spherical thin lens in three dimensions, or for a cylindrical thin lens in three dimensions. And you would basically get the same formulas. Um, now, of course, the difficulty is going to be uh, finding these input H and uh, D parameters, uh, given some random oriented uh, lens of either of these two types, uh, you will have some uh, work cut out before you actually find D0 and H0 and can use these formulas. So uh, we're going to do uh, exactly this example, but we're going to do it in PGA, of course. 
Um, and for that, I've prepared a new coffee shop example. So that's just uh, uh, the thing from before where I hit a new button that I changed the fonts a bit up so that it will be easier for you guys to read. So to get started with Gantt.js, we need to create our algebra. Um, to create our algebra, that's just the algebra keyword. We have to specify how many positive, negative, and zero basis vectors we want. So let's start in 2D PGA, which means we want two positive uh, basis vectors, zero and negative ones, and one zero basis vector. And the last argument is a function here in which we can just do geometric algebra. So we could do things like uh, check what the basis vector uh, E1 squares do. And you can see here that it squares to one uh, as we expect. Um, it's also quite easy to visualize elements and we'll be doing that. So we can actually uh, return a graph which takes a function and some objects, uh, uh, some options in an object uh, like this. Let's say we want a grid. And now we can return a bunch of elements that we want graphed. So for example, if we graph E1, this would be the linear equation x equals zero, which would be the y-axis. Um, so not sure you can see it, but let's make the lines a bit thicker. So now it's maybe even more. It's quite clear, that's the y-axis. Similarly, 1E2 would be the uh, x-axis, 1E12. Um, the bivector here is the origin. You can also label elements. So if we uh, follow something up with a, a string, then it actually gets a label. Uh, let's make that a big, bigger too. Right. So we want to do the uh, thin lens example, and we'll create a bunch of variables for that. So let's create our lens variable. Um, and we'll now have to think about um, what type we want it to be, because remember we have these two types um, and the type actually gets determined to, by what we want to happen when we go to three dimensions. Um, so the lens we're actually going to uh, define as a linear equation. So we're just going to use x is zero here for our lens, which indeed in two dimensions will give us the y-axis and then when we go to three dimensions that will actually give us uh, a plane. Um, so that's perfect. Another thing we will need is um, the focal point. Um, so the focal point, when we move to three dimensions, uh, we want it to stay a point. So let's say it is uh, this point. So we now have our lens and our focal point. We'll also need a center point. So let's make a center point, which is going to be, again, defined dually, since we want it to be a point when we go to three dimensions. And in this case, it's just the origin. It's going to sit right here. And then we need a point. Let's call it a world point to transform. Um, and that's also always going to be a point. So let's say uh, even more to the left and maybe a little bit uh, up, something like this. And then we just add them to the list to render them. Maybe we should set up some colors here. So if we give a hexadecimal number, it'll interpret it as a color. So we can just make these guys blue and then maybe make this guy red. Something like that. Um, and then we should probably add some labels. Um, let's say the focal is going to be called F and the center is going to be called C. Right. Um, so the first thing uh, we need to do to do this uh, per actual, per actual uh, approximation for the thin lens is um, we need to construct some rays that emit from this point. And there's a couple of rays where we know exactly how it behaves. So the easiest one is this one. If you go through the center of a thin lens, then nothing happens. You basically just continue straight ahead. Um, so we're going to create that line. Let's call it L1 by simply uh, using the joint product, the regressive product, and by simply saying this is the world point joined to the center. So let's render that, see what we get. So that's this line. 
Um, so that's one line that we know is uh, going through the image point. So if you can find a second line that goes through the image point, it's going to be possible to determine the image point. And we actually know a second line because uh, there's another rule that says that if a ray emits through the focal point, then it will exit the mirror at an orthogonal angle. So we can construct that too quite easily. We do it like this. We start with that second line which is, of course, just uh, the world joined to the focal. Let's le render that too for a second. That's this line. Now we want to intersect that with the mirror, which is, of course, really easy. Let's call that the, uh, LP for point or something like that. And that would be L2 intersected with the mirror lens, of course. So that's this point. Let's remove this one so we can clearly see the point. Right, and now we need to have um, this emanating ray and we actually um, need to think about what happens when we do this in three dimensions because we want uh, something that is orthogonal to the, the lens and the point. And the way to do it would be this one. We would say this is LP dot and then any point on the lens joint to LP. So if we render uh, L3 now, we get this line and now we can actually make it the image point by saying maybe in a different color. By simply saying the image point is the intersection of L1 and L3. And let's maybe render a little triangle so that we can still see what's going on. Uh, we can render triangles like this as an array. Um, and so we'll take the world point, we'll take the image point, and we'll take this LP point. And then we need to come here. Maybe make it a little brighter. So this is our uh, basic setup. We can move our world point and we can see how it basically constructs this line here. It constructs this line here, finds the intersection point, constructs this line here, and then intersects those two lines to figure out where the image point is. And this is, of course, exactly what we saw on this image here. We have this one line going through the center, that one passes through it, and then we have this line passing through the focal point. And where it hits the mirror, it exits uh, straight. So this is the thing that we've just implemented. All right, so we've got this working in 2D now. And because we spent some time thinking about how to define our elements, so we made a lens A1 vector, and then we made the focal center and world, world explicitly D vectors. So if we change this to three dimensions, then our lens is actually a plane but everything else still just works. So we can still just figure out what uh, image point our focal point, uh, what image point our world point ends up at. And we can see that this is now this uh, as expected radially symmetric setup. So if I move left and right or up and down, this always goes, uh, uh, this works the same way. Now this is not all, we, don't, we can't just do 2D and 3D with the same piece of code, but we can actually also do the cylindrical lens. Now, if we do the cylindrical lens, then actually what happens is the focal point, it doesn't stay a point, it becomes a line. And the same thing goes for the center. So let us just uh, overwrite our focal and our center um, with the non-dual versions. So we're just gonna take the non-dual non versions of these guys. For the center, that's really easy. That's just the origin. And we're back into 2D, so that is 1E12. E, one, for the focal point, it's the same thing, it's the origin minus. So we take the origin minus 0.5 E to zero. And so this won't change anything if we do it in two, two dimensions, but now if we look at the three dimensional version, what we see is our focal point is now a line, our center of our lens is now a line, and what happens is when we have an image point, it actually gets displayed as a line, so when you put a cylindrical mirror in front of a point, then the image will actually be a line. And if you were to look at these in-between planes that we construct, um, they are now planes. So there were lines before, but you can see now that this L1 plane still goes through the center, 
but since the center is a line, that means it becomes a plane, and so it hits here, and similarly, the, the L2 plane will go through this guy. Actually, make it a bit bigger to see it. So it goes through this thing, and it then hits the mirror here, which is, of course, uh, where L3 will orthogonally be uh, at. Make it even bigger, like this. So everything still works um, with the same code and exactly the same setup, uh, even though we change the focal and the center from points to lines. Um, and so if we turn this back off, we get our original setup again. And as you can see, these are for this point is actually the same solution. This is the same point that gets mapped over there, because of course the we on, we only changed the way the focal and the center were defined. We didn't actually change them. There's, it's the line through that exact point and the line through this exact point that we had. So that's our first example, the paraxial optics, where we see that in PGA we basically get those same features without the difficulty of having to find these parameters first, and we've done everything really uh, in a very geometric way. So now onto the sec second example where we'll be doing inverse kinematics. Um, so we'll just move this back down to two dimensions and we'll delete all of these. That's our starting point. So we are going to make a kinematic chain. It'll have a number of segments. Let's give that a number. Let's start with, uh, let's say, uh, three segments, something like that. Um, what we have to do next is create an array of points. Um, so we create an array of one point more because we want three segments, so we need to have four points for that. Um, and let's fill it in. And again, this is the robot arm example, so we use the dual construction to uh, create our points. Um, let's do i minus uh, n over 2. And let's put them um, uh, 50 centimeters apart, so that would be 0 0.5 e1. Let's see what we got. A mistake, of course. Um, I'm not seeing it for a second. Oh, deleted a bit too much here. Yes, so sorry for that. We got our points. Um, so these are four points. Now we need a base point and a target point. And let's just take uh, the first point. And we're going to so force a clone here. And the target, the last point. And we'll render those in a different color. Maybe make the points a bit bigger. Something like that. Um, we also want the segments. So let's make the segments. Lines is an array of n, of course. And then we'll fill it in. e smaller than n uh, plus plus e. And we'll say lines e is, and we can just make it an array of which is a little line segment from points E to points E plus 1. Uh, let's render those two. And maybe make them even fatter, something like that. All right, so this is our basic setup. Uh, now what we want is when we move this target, we basically want this arm following us, and at the same time we want the first point to be restricted by the base. And we will do this in, in a, with a simple, very geometric, iterative, uh, iterative procedure. 
So this is our, our, our IK procedure, function IK. It will take a base, a target, and a chain. I'm going to use short letters because I have to type them. And then, of course, we will have to call it uh, IK with a base target points. And then the first thing we do is we will um, take this last, let actually move our target a little bit so we can work easily um, a little bit to the left and let's say a little bit uh, up. So our target is here. Um, what we want now is to reach the target. So let's just pretend that we reach it and we'll set the last point to the target. So we say cn.set target. And what we'll do next, of course, is we, we now made this thing too long. So let's move this dot over this line until we restore that length we originally had of 0 0.5. And for that, we actually will need a function that translates a given distance over a line. So let's make that two line distance. And that would be 1 minus 0 0.5 times distance times 1 e 0 times line of normalized times the dual of 1 e 0. This is on the cheat sheet. It's just one of those formulas to know. So we now run over all the points starting from n minus 1 up to the last point, the first point actually. And what we will do is we will set the point by taking the next point and moving it back with a translation over the line from the current point to the next point over a distance of minus 0 0.5. And of course, there's a mistake. I have all small c's. Like this. Um, so what you can see now is that uh, we're already reaching the target, and we've moved all of the other points, but we've let go of the base. And of course, we can't do that. So let's correct that. Let's put the base back in place. Um, so we take the zeroth point, and we put it back to the base. Um, like this. And then, of course, we have the same problem now. Now this thing is too long, so let's again restore the lengths just as we did before. We basically, it's a different four anyway. So now we start from point one and we go up to point uh, n. And what we do is the opposite thing. So we set point E to the previous point, again translated with the previous point, joined to the current point, but this time over a distance of 0 0.5. And so what we have now is an inverse kinematic solver, right? And if we turn on the animations, because it'll actually be calling it all the time. And it is uh, quite customizable, so we could have some more of these uh, guys, and that still works. And of course, since again we we chose uh, a certain way of defining our points and our lines and doing our movements, and that makes that we can now simply switch this thing to three dimensions, and we get basically a working uh, IK solver in three dimensions, and it's it's really in three dimensions, so you can now. Uh, move it uh, all over. Um, and this is the uh, exact same piece of code. All right, so that's it for the inverse kinematic solver. And that uh, concludes uh, episode five. And we'll be back with episode six, where we'll do some more of this programming and we'll actually be programming up a rigid body dynamic solver. Okay, see you in a bit. All right. Hello and welcome to episode 6, A New Hope 2, from the SIPGRAPI 2021 course on the plane-based geometric algebra. 
My name is still Steven and in this programming episode we will be implementing the rigid body dynamics engine that we've been talking about before. So you may remember this slide, which was the overview of how rigid body dynamics would work in an n-dimensional setup. And it has a, a lot of stuff on there, but really this orange box down here is all you need to know to get the implementation going. Now we want to do this implementation in a dimension agnostic way. And to do that, we will actually need to create a dimension agnostic rigid body. So we want to have this little square uh, hanging on a string uh, with Hooke's law and then we want to be able to change the number of dimensions so I don't want to define a square and a cube separately. I sort of want to bring that together. Um, I could have just copy pasted this bit of code but it's not that difficult so I figured it's nicer if we can just start from an empty page. Um, so how do we make a square in any number of dimensions? Well, we're going to start by just creating the correct number of points. So that's 2 to the d, where d is the dimension that you're in. So that's 4 points for a square in 2 dimensions, 8 points for a cube in 3 dimensions, and so on. Then we'll just give them some numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, and then we'll convert those numbers to binary. And then when you do that, you might note that you can actually just use that as coordinates. So you basically use one bit for each coordinate axis. Um, and this always works. So in 3D, it will give you the correct edges, the correct corner points that you expect. The edges that I've done here now are just all the possible edges. So all the lines that connect all of the possible point pairs. Um, and of course, we don't want these inner edges. So we just want really the outer edges for a square. And the same goes for a cube. We don't want any diagonal edge. We just want the straight edges. And you can easily recognize the straight edges because they only differ in one bit. So all of the diagonal edges, they differ in two bits, um, and the straight ones don't. So we need a good test to do that. And uh, the test to do that is this old school bit fielding trick where you XOR the two numbers and then end it with a decrement. And if that's zero, then they're exactly one bit different. All right, so now that we know how to do that, let's uh, actually do it. Um, we're going to store the number of dimensions that we're working in as a global variable. Uh, then we're going to create a PGA of that dimension. And we're going to immediately start by creating our points. So we start from an array of 2 to the dimension of D. And then we take those guys, or rather their index, and we convert that to binary. And actually, if we, I can show you what we're doing. So we've converted it to binary. But these guys um, are missing the, the leading digits here. So let's add those in by just saying, uh, take some zeros and then slice it back down to D dimensions. So now we get this one. And now we can convert that to little arrays by splitting it on the empty string. And that gives us this, and we might actually want to subtract 0 0.5 here from all of the numbers so that our uh, square or box will be centered. Um, and then, of course, these are just coordinates. We need to convert them to PGA points. And so to do that, let's take the origin and then take our point and multiply that with our coordinates at least multiply that with some of these basis factors. And that should give us PGA points. And then, of course, at this point, we could actually graph them. So let's do that too. These are our points. Let's make them a bit bigger. And I'm probably going to want bigger edges later on too. So the edges, we still need to select them out. For that, we say consider all box points A and consider all box points B. And then we're going to ask a question and we might return 0 or the edge between A and B. And then 
that's going to be an array of arrays, so we're going to flatten that once. And then the question we're going to ask is, okay, if it's a relevant edge or the condition I was talking about earlier, we XOR them and end that with a decrement. And that should give us the edges, which we can now render instead of the points. forgot a map here, like that. So these are the edges, and this will work in three dimensions too. And so this is basically the rigid body we can use to do our physics. Um, all right, to the order of business. To do the physics, we need a physics state. The physics state consists out of a motor. Uh, the simplest motor we can think of, of course, is the identity. So let's just do that one. And then what we want is uh, some random rotation to start with. And maybe uh, for now, a little bit of. Of course, we also need a differential function on the state. This takes a motor and a velocity by a vector, and it returns a new state being uh, minus 0 0.5 times m times b. And then the dual of the commutator product, minus 0 0.5 times the dual of b times b minus b times the dual of b. That's our differential. And then, of course, we would need to use the motor to transform our, our edges. Um, and this needs to be a comma. And we also need to update our state. So let's do a simple Euler integrator. For an Euler integrator, we just do, uh, let's say, 10 steps. And at each step, we update the state by adding in a little bit. Uh, we're going 60 frames per second. We want to be at about seconds. So uh, we have 10 steps. And we just divide by 600. Multiply that with the differential function on the current state. And then we have to turn on the animation. And we get our uh, animating cube. So this is just the kinematics part. If we take over the translation, this is what we get. Um, that's, of course, a bit boring. Let's add in some forks. So we'll call that f. It's also a function that takes in a current motor and velocity by vector. Um, the first force we'll do is gravity, and to do gravity, we basically just take gravity, that is that uh, specific direction, but of course this direction is in world space, and so we want to uh, move it with the reverse of the mode, and then we want to dualize that because we need to return force lines, fork lines. And then, of course, we need to add in the forks, and they just go here. And so now we have gravity, and our box is falling down. Let's also do some damping. Damping is quite easy. Um, it is really just minus zero, some percentage of your current velocity by vector. But again, we have to return it as a force line. So that does damping. It doesn't show us a lot, of course. Let's make uh, it a bit more interesting by adding in Hooke's law. For Hooke's law, we will first need an attachment point in the world space. So we just take our last point and let's render that too. So that's our attachment point. And then we have to calculate, of course, Hooke's law. And Hooke's law is, as I promised, super easy. Um, so what we do is we take the attachment point and we move it back into the body frame. And then we just create a line by using the join operator with the exact same point. 
like this. And then of course we need some spring strength. Let's do something like that. And now we have our box on the string. Maybe we want to render that string by saying, okay, that is from the world space attachment point to the world space version of the last point. And that gives us our string. Um, so maybe we want to move it up a little bit by just using a simple motor on everything. Good. This is our uh, uh, stringy box as promised. So it's about 30 lines of code with lots of space. Um, and it does everything in a very geometric way. So all of these forces are, ho are uh, lines. So hook is really a line by joining two points. Uh, the damping is a line because the velocity was a, uh, a bivector and we uh, dualized it. So this thing was an, an acceleration type element and we've made it into a force. And we did the same thing basically here with, with gravity. And so this will actually work also in three dimensions. And so in three dimensions, we actually get a cube and the cube dangles on the string exactly as you expect. And of course, why stop there? Because we can also do this in four dimensions. And what we now get is a tesseract on a string. And as before, nothing has changed. Um, everything is still that same geometric type of treatment, even though we are now solving the kinematics and dynamics problem in four dimensions. Um, so I hope that is a convincing demonstration of uh, the power of PGA. And I also hope that it makes people realize that there is more to PGA than taking existing formulas and translating them into some new elements. Um, you really need to uh, consider everything that PGA has to offer to, to get the application at a level where, where it becomes a, a big benefit to be using this framework. Okay, so I hope everybody had a lot of fun and hopefully um, we'll be talking on the bivector.net Discord. Bye. So th thank you, Will and Steven, for the great tutorial. Uh, the last example is mind blowing. <laughs> when you put in one more dimension there. Um, now uh, we, we will open for questions and answers uh, from the audience. Uh, we have uh, five questions. Uh, I saw that you already answered two of them uh, directly on the chat uh, at YouTube. Um, but, but maybe you can, uh, we can uh, come back to them again. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, the, the first question uh, was made by Edward Castal. Uh, he's saying that, uh, do you have any suggestions on the best way to gradually introduce geometric algebra ideas in a computer graphics uh, 101 course uh, undergraduate level. Um, what would, would be a good starting point? Um, for an undergraduate level, I think we have an excellent text coming up by Leo, which should be available shortly. It's actually called PGA Easy and it uh, uh, tries to sort of take a PGA native approach without having to go back to the classic methods. And so it should be ideal to people who aren't exposed yet to the classic methods. Um, and so hopefully you'll, it'll be available on bivector.net uh, really soon. Yeah, there, there is already a PGA for CS, which is also available on bivector.net. But um, that's a text of 100 pages, which turns out to be a bit too much for most people. So I have written an easier version, including the latest insights and also including the pointers to uh, how the dynamics works in there uh, to give an, an easier overview of what it is about. You will still, for the details, be referred to the PGA for CS text. And uh, there's also a text coming up about the dynamics in detail. Uh, that's also largely written, but we want to reorganize it. All of those texts are freely available. You don't have to buy books anymore these days. Nice. OK. And, um, uh, the, 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 the next two questions uh, the, uh, were made at the Bivector Discord server. 
right. and you already answered that uh, uh, directly on the chat. But uh, if you could, could talk about uh, them a little bit more, yeah. uh, it would be great. I think the, the, the performance question, so there was a question somebody uh, asked about whether or not any, um, let me see if I can find it back for a second. Uh, I have it here. Um, okay. On the subject of graphics programming, one thing I haven't seen done by uh -huh. uh, anyone yet is benchmarking to prove the uh, new EasyGA way is equivalent to the old triad and true complex but fast way. So that's a, a good question. Um, I'll answer it specifically for PGA because for GA in general, it's a bit more of a uh, a diff, I mean, an, 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 an unanswered question. But for PGA, it's quite easy. And the reason it is quite easy is that the elements that we have in PGA, uh, the homogeneous points, uh, linear equations, Plucker corners for lines, um, dual quaternions for motors, these are exactly the elements of which we already know in computer graphics that they are the fastest implementation and the ideal implementation for a series of tasks. And they're exactly isomorphic, what PGA adds is it connects all of these concepts beautifully together. Um, it defines very, very strictly what the interplay between all, all of these elements is. And it uh, enables a geometric interpretation that in a classic treatment of computer graphics, unfortunately, is lost um, because we already had those homogeneous coordinates. But how many graphics programmers truly understand uh, what this W coordinate is doing and what the implications are what elements at infinity are and so on. So PGA adds a lot of insight into the code we already have running. But apart from that, it is exactly the same code. It is coefficient by coefficient the same. So you don't really need to benchmark this. Once you can prove this isomorphism, it's it's trivial that it is possible to have an implementation that is exactly equally fast. And uh, what you what you gain by the fact that it's all part of a unified framework is that you don't need the extra routines that are required to convert your rotation matrix to your quaternions or the other way around. So you can stay within the whole framework completely. So that part of your code, which was wasting time in going to that specialized framework, now disappears. And on top of that, I think, what well, also would make it hard to benchmark if you really want to benchmark the difference of PGA. So we've already established that because of this isomorphic nature to the techniques we're using, it should be at the same level of performance. But of course, there is a difference because at a higher level, um, this extra realization of how the concepts work will definitely help you uh, optimize higher level algorithms, things you were not able to write as an algebraic expression like the join between two lines. We classically have this as a function call now, but you can't uh, mathematically optimize function calls if it's an expression, if it's A wedge B, and then there's some other B, you will see this and you'll be able to use simple algebraic rules to optimize your, your graphics algorithms. Um, and so the real performance gain that still is there from PGA sits at a higher level, which by definition is more difficult to benchmark. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, I interrupt you. No. No, 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 no. Please. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that, that's. I, I think that. I hope that answers the question. Oh, uh, I believe so. Uh, so, um, the next question is about the episode one. Uh, AAP asked uh, Stephen, "You had center looking at the eye, and not eye at the center. Was that?" Yeah. The it's quite possible that I missed that up. I, I'm not sure. I, I'd have to now go and check. I just assumed that it was the other way around. It doesn't make any difference, of course. It's a, it's a misnomer if, if it's wrong. Uh, and in that case, I apologize. And you'll have to swap it all by yourself. As I was watching it real time, I was also getting confused. <laughs> we, all, we already <laughs> talked about this. <laughs> so yeah, possibly I mixed it up. I, I uh, now. Uh, to Leo, I still said, no, no, it's like that. But now that uh, somebody else also has the same, uh, I'm going to have to check whether or not I missed See, it. It was a smart yeah. remark by me, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, the, the next, next question uh, was also made at the uh, vector server. Um, but but I didn't um, note that um, the user 
I can't say his name because it's a bunch of letters together <laughs> with no sense. Yeah. Uh, he's asking, uh, uh, what was Rio going to say about Newtonian uh, something something before? Yeah, I think in the very, about... very introduction of uh, episode two, there was a little glitch uh, in the presentation. You can watch the presentations again because they're available on YouTube. Um, I don't believe I was saying more than announcing that something else was coming. So didn't miss anything important there. Okay, I I didn't saw that that glitch. Maybe it was local. Um, and finally, I have one question too. Uh, uh, PGA is very interesting, uh, of course, and, and it's it's halfway between projective geometric algebra with the classical homogeneous coordinate and Euclidean metric, uh, which can only encode rotations as versus, and the conformal geometric algebra, which can also encode translations and uniform scaling as versus. Mm -hmm. So you are between these two uh, uh, geometric algebras. Um, uh, so, but, but what's the next step to include uh, no uniform scaling or even any affine or project transformation uh, into the framework? Yeah, so I have already done that. Um, and there is an article um, about R33, which is what precisely does that. Um, so it does make projective transformations into versus, into motors, and it gives you the structure preservation. Uh, the issue I had with that is that it lives in basically the space of Plucker coordinates, in the space of lines, and uh, a point is now going to be represented not as the intersection of three planes as we do here, but as a certain combination of lines. You know, you need three lines to hit in the right way to encode a point. So even though the algebra is there and it performs exactly as you would expect from a geometric algebra encoding your basic things, namely perspectivities and project, uh, projected transformations and nonlinear scaling as motors, it does that. Um, the modeling of objects has to be done by what are called line complexes. And uh, there are people with experience in this. There's a nice book by Potman and Walder that that talks about this and sees how to apply it to all sorts of practical applications. But it is that part that really needs to develop to make it a practical tool. You you have to, to think in terms of planes is already a bridge too far for a lot of people uh, looking into PGA. Uh, we're demanding even more by looking into modeling things with the space of lines. But it does work. And if you're interested, look it up. Um, it has been worked out. It's always the question that people ask from the point of view of uh, computer graphics, because you're so used to seeing Euclidean motions as a special case of projective transformations. Um, and that's not the road that PGA takes. It, it really develops completely for Euclidean motions by itself. Uh, but that you want the other things still to get them onto the screen is also true. And then one last uh, remark perhaps on that because the mindset as we presented it today where you built everything with reflections in planes uh, is actually a mindset that uh, extends trivially to the conformal group so if you imagine having this reflection in a plane and you then bend the plane a tiny little bit then it actually becomes a sphere um, and so you get an inversion in a sphere as a basic operation and you can develop all of conformal geometric algebra using vectors or spheres instead of vectors or points, and you can just see planes as spheres with an infinite radius. This is how the Euclidean group, group gets embedded, and everything stays the same. The bi-reflections are still your continuous transformations. They are the combination of two inversions in spheres and so on, and they generate the entire conformal group. Um, actually, going down is also the same mindset. So if you consider only the planes through the origin, you will get the orthogonal group, and you can use this. Same. So also when talking about introducing this material to undergrad students, I think it's very important that uh, you note that this idea, this mindset that we use in PGA truly is very intuitive. It uses just normal planes. You can show this with mirrors to people. You can show them a point reflection by having three orthogonal mirrors, and you can explain to them that if you put this thing on the moon, then that's the trick to get a laser to point exactly back. Uh, because you need, if you would use a flat mirror, you'd have to have an incredibly good aim. 
but if you use a point reflection, then all these rays will bounce back exactly where they came from and so on. So you can really practically show them these things, teach them these things, perhaps even at a, at a level before undergrad. Um, and so this is really a very intuitive way of looking at things, even though it's not the intuition that we've been taught to have with years of uh, linear algebra and looking at arrows. Um, so it's a different intuition, but it's actually supernatural. Um, so I think it's a challenge for people to see how this can be explained to younger and younger people. And I definitely think it can. Yeah, so you, you kindly referred to uh, that old book that I wrote uh, a long time ago. Um, <laughs> <That one. laughs> yes, if I would redo it now, and you know, I'm sort of doing it as online tutorials, I would really prefer to start from the PGA because it gives the, the, the geometry that you would have to have, would like to have immediately. It also shows the importance of not just looking at Euclidean metrics, which was a long time for me to leave um, it places the, the motions central and uses the objects as properly transforming things like invariance under those motions. Um, I would still also cover the conformal model, but in the book, um, you see that when I go to homogeneous coordinates, I have something that isn't a quite nice geometric algebra because I didn't have what we have now. I didn't have PGA. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, originally that tutorial that's 100 pages now uh, was a substitute for chapter 11 in this book. Um, it's becoming different now. I really, I really would teach it in a different order. And I would, we, we, Stephen and I saw making this tutorial as a tryout of this other way of introducing people to what you'd like to happen geometrically and how that is actually reflected directly in the algebra. So um, we would now see the normal starting point that people mm -hmm. have for Euclidean geometric algebra, you know, the R, uh, GR00, 300. Um, we would actually see that that what happened if you are only interested in staying at a certain point, but you normally aren't. So why start there? Mm -hmm. um, it's just, we hope to have shown by this tutorial, and this was our, our tryout, uh, that it's it's not just starting in the middle, it's starting at the right place, which shows you all the concepts in their richness. It shows the necessity for elements that square to zero that you might not have expected. Um, and this is now, for us, the natural starting point to try and bring these ideas across. Well, at least uh, for me, this story w was uh, great to open my mind, and, and I, I certainly will uh, change my uh, course uh, on geometric algebra to start from PGA instead of uh, homogeneous uh, model. It makes much more sense, and it seem, uh, I believe that it will be easier for these students to. Excellent. It's 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 a natural correspondence to what you ultimately want to do, and you get there much more quickly. <laughs> so, uh, uh, no. uh, Stephen. Good. No, no, fine. Thank you. Great that you are going to uh, teach PGA. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we don't have more questions. Um, let's check once more here. No, we don't have any questions mm -hmm. at Discord. Uh, so uh, I would like to to call Eduardo for this uh, for this talk. Eduardo, are you here? He has he has some announcements to do. Uh, your, your mic is yes. Off. Hi. So hello, hello everyone. Thank you, Leo and Stephen, for the great tutorial, and thank you, Leandro, for for sharing this session. Uh, Maggie, can you can you put on the ending slide? The next one, I think. Yes, yeah, so thanks everyone for, for watching. Uh, you can continue the conversation for this tutorial on our Discord channel and also on Bivectors Discord channel. Uh, and I'd like to invite everyone to the opening ceremony for CBGRAPI, SVR, and SP Games uh, today at 1.30 p.m. So thank you, everyone, and see you on the next sessions. Bye-bye. <laughs>